Well, good morning, Crossing. So great to see you today if you're watching online. So great that you are here. I don't know if you recognize it, but it's still not fall. I, I, I was all set. I had this like cool sweater I was going to wear today. And I had it out last night and I put it on this morning and I went outside. I'm like, it just, it's not going to work. Like, like I'm sweating, like back sweating and it would be embarrassing. And so I had to go short sleeves. So you get short sleeves and elbows for another few weeks. But uh, it's a great time of year as we are, are continuing to dive into this series we're in. I also don't know if you recognize that life is full of mysteries. You know that? I, I, I hope you would agree that the longer we live, the more we know. And yet it seems like the less we actually truly understand. And the more we live, the more that life feels like it's, a, it's kind of a mystery. There are just life mysteries that simply can't be explained. Things like, uh, why do I always choose the, choose the slowest line whenever faced with multiple options? Who knows? It's a mystery. Things like, why does the dental hygienist insist on carrying a conversation with me, even though with my mouth wide open, I have no shot at responding at all. Who knows? It's, it's a mystery. And last night I was thinking, why do I press harder on the buttons of the remote, even though I know the batteries are dead, as if somehow it's going to work if I press hard? These are mysteries. No one actually knows. And there are also mysterious places and seasons in our lives that all of us must navigate. These mysterious places are, they're truly like tricky and scary and intimidating. We wish we could skip over them, but instead we have to go through them. And one of the most mysterious times of our lives, one of the most mysterious seasons of our lives is the years known as middle school. Think back. Some of you have to think way back. You remember the time, you're awkward, life is awkward, everyone around you is awkward. And one of the most awkward and mysterious places in that season is what is known as the school cafeteria. Now, I am convinced that it's one of the scariest places you have to walk through earlier in your life. Most of us encountered it, some of us survived it. What I'm referring to actually is not the food that was served, though in and of itself, that may have been a mystery as well. But rather, I'm talking about that moment when you had your tray. Or maybe you were, if you're a tray, you were a buy lunch person, raise your hand, buying lunch, yes, you were elite. If you were a brown bag person, right, how many brown bag people do we have? A lot of you, right? It's that moment when you walked out into that vast abyss of tables and chairs, and all of those people, and, and you looked out and you were, it was a difficult moment because you were looking for a seat. The school lunch table is the centerpiece. It's, it, it represents that human desire to be loved and also the ability to be loving. Now, when you walked out with your tray or your brown bag, for some of you, the decision had already been made for you. Perhaps the color of your skin made that decision already. Perhaps the way you looked or simply your perceived social status, it was predetermined where you were supposed to sit and where you would never expect to sit. It was at those moments when you were desperate to find your people. You were looking for that safe place, right? The place you could be accepted and even possibly be loved. Typically, we tend to surround ourselves with people who like us or people who are like us. So it said a lot about you by the table you walked past and also said a lot about you by the table that you sat down at. It also said a lot about you as to who you allowed or invited or brought around your table. Maybe, maybe you walked past the table with all the athletes. Your dad failed you. He never taught you how to throw a ball. Maybe you walked past the table with all the pretty people looking out. I'm thinking many of you did. Maybe you didn't dare look up as you hurried past the table with the band kids or the drama crew table or the smart kids. By the looks of some of you, perhaps it was the stoners that you sat down next to at your school <laughs> or the hipsters. I, I confess I, I was early to this, so I was a Christian in middle school and high school, 
But I usually chose to walk past the table that had all the Christian kids at it. Once in a while, I would sit down at the table, but it was always so strange. The conversations there were just different. Everyone, everything was always a God thing. I remember this one girl, I really do, her name was Robin, who would say things like, I'm so glad they served pizza today. I've been praying hard since first period about it. And boom, God showed up. I was like, wow. But we all know this doesn't just end after middle school or after high school. Of course not. We're still constantly in that flow of trying to find our people, trying to establish the boundaries of our tables, the sitting arrangement, trying to establish the height, the depth, the breadth and width of our love for others. And this is the mysterious part that Paul is about to reveal to the Ephesians and to you and I. In Ephesians chapter three, he's gonna reveal to us how our ability to love is the great illuminator of our ongoing process of being made new. When Jesus was asked about what stood out among the commandments, his response was love God and love people. Very simple. And Paul picks up the same thing. But how do you, how do you love in a way that isn't just a Sunday thing, right? Where we're all just sitting here all cozy together. But how do we love in a way that comes from the inside, where it extends into the tough moments and parts of our week, where it extends into the challenging relational circles of our lives, where it extends even to the most difficult people and the most difficult places where love is tough and disdain is easier. To be, to be made new, to be changed, means our ability to love others is always growing. And it's actually going to have to require we're going to learn something different from us. And this is how God actually set it up from the beginning. He loves so we can as well. Here's the main idea today. So if you need to go to brunch early, you got it. You can go step out. It's great. God's love extends to all and he expects ours, he expects our love to do the same. How can this be? People are difficult. In our humanness, this frankly seems impossible. And Paul knew it would be difficult. So difficult, in fact, that he calls it this, a mystery. How do we do this? And in Ephesians 3, Paul begins by writing about this incredible mystery of God's love. Here we begin in verse 3. He writes the following. He said, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of of you Gentiles, remember that word, note that word, we're coming back to it in just a moment. Surely, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, my responsibility of preaching and sharing God's grace. Surely you've heard that. That it is the mystery, there's that word, made known to me by revelation, as, I've always, as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery, there's that word again, the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, wasn't fully known as it is, has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. And then in verse six, here comes the kicker. Get ready for it. Here, here's what's been revealed. The mystery is this, is that through the gospel, here's that word again, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. All of that, you're like, huh? let me help you. Here's what makes this such a mystery. The gospel means simply good news. And Paul is saying to all of us and to the church at Ephesus that through this gospel, Jesus established God's kingdom, how we, how we behave and look in God's kingdom while extending grace and salvation to us through his death, on the cross and his resurrection. That's the good news. That's the gospel. But then it gets a little bit more mysterious. The mystery spreads because Paul reveals this, that God included the Gentiles in the good news. And you're like, okay, but when they read this, their minds would have been blown. This would have been shocking to the people receiving this letter. Paul is saying they are heirs, he uses that word, with Israel. That is the crazy mystery that we are all part of this same family. We are all invited to sit down together with God at the same 
table. Now, to really understand that verse and its magnitude, you have to back up. You have to back up for a second and process the Old Testament as a whole. Now, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, it's okay. But when you go back and you read through it, what you're gonna see is that it's largely the story of God's relationship with one country, with one nation, the nation of Israel. And it chronicles God's special relationship with them, how God does all these things. He makes a promise through Abraham. He leads them out of, out of slavery. He, he puts them into a country of their own. He works through kings. He works through prophets. He works through wars and famines. And it's God's special relationship over and over again with Israel. So it's no wonder when we get to the New Testament and you start reading about the Jewish people that they kind of thought they were God's chosen golden boys and golden girls. God's table was their table. It's all they knew was that up to this point was God's special relationship with them. Just think about this word, Gentile. That's not a word you're gonna use this week, probably. Not a word we use normally today in our vernacular, but when you read the Bible, you see it all the time. And the word Gentile was a word that Jews came up with to simply describe anyone and anybody who wasn't them. They didn't even bother to come up with words for different people groups. It was just, you're a Gentile. And that's why when you read the New Testament, you may struggle and you may say, wow, it really seems like the Jewish people are having a hard time getting on board with Jesus what Jesus was teaching and what he was saying. This is why, because Jesus comes along and he starts leading and he's teaching and he's saying these radical new things and he's creating this movement of followers and he has zero political power. He could have garnered all of his followers together, all of them that he had, and he could have turned it into a political movement, but he didn't. It's zero political power. And this confused them and why their jaws probably hit the floor when Paul says both Jews and Gentiles are loved by God and can experience being made new, can experience transformation that comes from following Jesus. And God's plan from the very beginning was always to bring different people together through Jesus. It's how he set the whole things up. It didn't take, it didn't take him by surprise. He knew he was gonna work through Israel and he continues to. But he knew he's also going to use them to get to the rest of the world because God's love does not discriminate. Does not. It doesn't matter if you're black, if you're white, if you're brown, if you're rich or you're poor, if you're young or you're old or you're middle aged or you don't know, which means you're probably old. Listen, it doesn't, all those things don't matter. It doesn't matter what team you prefer. I'm wearing my Dodger blue shoes today, even though I'm a Giants fan, I'm trying to reverse jinx them a little bit. It doesn't matter what music or what kind of music you prefer or what your cultural background is. It doesn't matter if the home you live in is awesome or if you're struggling to keep your home. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from. God's love does not discriminate. If you believe in Jesus, he is for you and you have complete and total access. Now, transformation is what we believe needs to happen next. The transformation is part of this process, that we are in the ongoing process of being made new as we step into God's grace. But there's no more privilege, no more favoritism. There's no more preference shown. You're in. If you believe and you follow Jesus, you're in because God's plan before the get-go was to bring different people together through Jesus. Here at the crossing, we use this term, come as you are. And it's a great term until you actually apply it. It's an awesome term. It looks great on the wall, doesn't it? Come as you are. Until you actually have people coming as they are. Some of you are here today because you saw that as an invitation. You thought, okay, I'm gonna come as I am, we'll see, and here you are, and that's amazing. But Paul was telling them, God's love is bigger than we thought. God's love is not exclusive, it's, it's explosive. God loves everyone, everyone is invited. And by the way, let me reiterate to those of you that are listening today, God loves you. You may be questioning that. You're invited, I'm invited. I'm not sure why, because this is a mystery. Shocking that God wants us. Actually, Paul couldn't believe that he was included. Here's what he says in verse eight to the Ephesians. Though I am the, he goes, there's this mystery and God's grace and all these things and the Gentiles and the Jews together. And he says, I am the least deserving of all God's people. And you're thinking, Paul, I mean, you wrote like the bulk of the Bible, the New Testament. You can't be least deserving. Well, you need to go home and Google Paul's early years. 
Because when you do, you, if you don't know about it, man, Google it, because it's not pretty. There is death and destruction that he was delivered from. And yet, Paul is invited in. And that's the key part of the mystery. Who's invited? Everyone's invited. And this is a really, really big deal for all of us because most of us are Gentiles. And so again, I reiterate, God's love extends to all, and you're in that all. But he also expects our our love to do the same. And we're invited to sit at God's table only because of God's love. Now look at Paul's prayer as he closes, begins to close these thoughts. He says, for this reason, and I think think he writes this because he understands how difficult it is to extend God's love to others. And so he says, every day I gotta kneel before the Father. Let me translate. I fall on my knees and say, God help me. Every day. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its names. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. We need that. We need that strength to live this out. He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. What happens inside us, we believe change happens and we're transformed and what happens inside drives the love that we can have outside. In our inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then he begins to pray. I pray that you being rooted and established in, read it with me, love. May have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp, this is the great part, how wide, how long, and high, and deep is the love of Christ. And then important part, remember these words, coming back to it momentarily, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be feel, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul's prayer is that they would know God's love, that they would experience it, and they would understand how wide and long and high and deep his love, God's love is. And listen, his love is wider than your worst mistakes. Some of you made some this week. It's wider than that. His love is longer than some of the most painful days that you may have experienced, higher than the best efforts you have to achieve and get up higher and deeper than your darkest secret. That's his love. And when you've reached the limit of God's love, you think you have, think again. But I wanna know God's love in my own life and it's ongoing and I want you to know it too. And there is a depth of knowing God's love that allows us to transfer his love to the other people around us that Paul communicates and it can't be missed. In verse 19, Paul says this, I want you to know the love of Christ. And then he says, that is beyond knowledge. Huh? I want you to know it, Paul says, but you can't know it, kind of. But I think what happens is that actually Paul wrote this, he wrote this in the Greek language, and they had two different words for know, to know, or knowledge. One is oida. Oida means, in the Greek, it refers to intellectual knowledge. The other word that they use for, the, for no is gnosko, and this means experiential knowledge. You've heard me talk before about the experience my wife and I have had a couple times that we love so much where we walk this pilgrimage, the Camino de Santiago in Spain. You've heard me talk about it. It's this incredible journey we've taken that just consists of multiple days where you're just walking 10 to 15 miles and you're on this ancient pilgrimage with other people and it concludes in this ancient city, where you're, sacred city where you're together. But what's interesting that's relevant to today is that my wife and I learned about this pilgrimage like 10, 15 years ago. And we got really, really interested in it. And so when you're interested in something, what do you do? You start researching, right? You start reading about it and you're looking into it and you're going to websites and you're watching things and you're on YouTube and and you you go to all the ins and outs of the journey that you wanna know. And then even after we committed, we booked flights and we're like, we're gonna go and we're gonna walk and we had it all laid out. I just, as as the time was getting closer, I just kept reading because I got really interested in people's perspective and other people who had been there. I wanted to know everything I could know. And when the day came and we got on the flight, I was full, full of oida. I had intellectual knowledge. I knew everything about the Camino. And then we started walking. And we walked and our legs hurt. We drank a lot of cortados and we woke up earlier and we walked some more and we walked through the Spanish countryside and the different weather and it rained and it got hot and we met people from all over the world and we attended masses in Spanish that we didn't understand but they were powerful and we consumed way too many pastries. And along the way, 
we had these moments where we walked silently and we prayed constantly in our own minds and we did some true soul work. And now, you know what happened? I had gnosko. Right? We had experiential knowledge. I had experienced. So when you say, have you experienced the Camino? I have experienced the Camino. I don't just know about the Camino. And the word used in Ephesians 3, when Paul says we need, in order to love others, we need to know the love of God, is this word gnosko. Paul's saying, I want you to know the love of God, but not just in more information, not just in more of an informational way. In fact, it's way too big for you. It'll limit you if you just try to understand it intellectually. I want you to know it experientially. He's praying this because he wants it so bad for you and I. And here's why. Because when we have this experience, guess what? It opens up seats at our table. It opens up our table. It causes us to rethink how we see others, how we interact with others, and ultimately how we express the love of God to others. And this is very, very, very hard. That's why it's a mystery. Because it, the mystery of God's love forces us to embrace different. Different. When we huddle up with people who are just like us, pretty quickly, when we're with those people, we find the people who are not like us, and we breed a bias against them. It's just the way we're wired. But when you have interjected different into your life, when you have different people, and you have different uh, people you've developed relationship with, and different, different people you're working with, and different people maybe you're even church with, and small group with, different people you're doing life with, different doesn't breed bias. It actually breeds empathy. Different brings an ability to care about someone and feel what they're feeling, to, to at least see and someone understand what life is like in their shoes. And empathy is so important. If there was one word that would think it would solve a lot of our problems in the world and all these conflicts, it would simply be empathy. It's our ability, my ability, your ability to see why someone thinks like they do. I don't know why they think like that. Why they, why they feel the way they do, why they say and do the things they do. But if you can't do that, if you can't do that, if you don't have different people in your life, I'm telling you, you're gonna have a hard time being made new. You're gonna have a hard time that, for that to emerge into your heart and for you to reflect that. Because empathy gives you the ability to love people like Jesus loved them, the good news. Empathy gives you the ability to see people like God sees them. The problem is when you actually start doing it, when you actually start bringing different people into your circles, it's super challenging. It's uncomfortable, it introduces tension, it isn't always agreeable. You see, Paul knew and Jesus knew. And this is not a politically correct moment, by the way. Paul and Jesus, they're not, it's not being politically correct. It's simply the gospel, that there is a world out there that's dying and needs to see the love of God. And if you and I have truly, not just know about it, but we've truly experienced it and can start to embrace it, we're gonna love people who are different from us. And the world's gonna watch that and see that, and it's gonna become a dangerous kind of love that actually has the power to change the world. That's why Paul would end chapter three with these last two statements. Begin in verse 20, he says this. Now to him... Speaking of God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power. We need his power to do that in the work that is happening within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's like Paul's saying, you know what? If you love different, Jesus can give you the strength, the power to do it. And if you do it, he's going to accomplish more, imaginable, more than you can imagine more than you could ever ask or think. One translation of this verse uses the word infinitely more. I like that. He will change the world incrementally through us. But it starts with all of us experiencing in our hearts and minds how incredibly and immense and immeasurable the love of Jesus is. And this is the part I need to hear. If you checked out, come back for a second. I believe that your view of God will be as small as the size of your table. If you keep a small table, your view of God will always be that small. But you will also find that if you're, as your view of God grows, as we make room for other people at our table, I think when you invite other people to sit down and you welcome them, it actually grows our faith. It actually makes us emerge like a butterfly. It makes our view of God bigger. It allows us to show others what he is like and what he feels about them. He makes us 
new. So here's the challenge for you and I as we close today. We have to rethink who's at our table. Maybe you work with someone who is different. Are you ready to invite them to the table to come and see? Maybe you work with someone who has a different kind of lifestyle. Are you ready to invite them to the table to come and see? Maybe you go to school with, maybe you live across the street with someone who wouldn't seem like they would be part of your group. They would walk by carrying their tray. But are you ready to invite them to come and see? I loved all the, the experiences we had yesterday at Midtown. Um, we had, as Jake mentioned earlier, we had hundreds, 500 volunteers and just an incredible team. About 1,000 of our neighbors in that area um, in our For the City outreach were touched. Here's what was incredible about yesterday. Is sometimes we can do these outreach things and people come and you, you know, we hand them a lot of things that they physically need. And, and that's amazing because people have physical needs. At the same time, what was different about yesterday that I was walking around observing was that there, was, there were moments and there were intentional places where connection could happen. There were people that were sitting. They, didn't, they were different. They were sitting across from each other in a, a chair and there was a conversation happening. There was prayers happening. There was haircuts happening. There was a little girl sitting getting her haircut for the first time because her mom said, I can't afford to take her to get her haircut, so we're doing it now. There were, there were families getting pictures taken. There, were, there was meals being shared. It was incredible. It was love personified. And there were a lot of different people, right? When I looked around there, I thought, these are not my people, all these people, right? There's this video that someone sent to us. This is a little girl, and she's getting shoes. She's loving her shoes, okay? Loves the shoes, and I love the shoes too. I mean, they're like turquoise, and that's, okay, listen, that is love right there, because You go, oh, she got shoes. No, 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 no. That family, I believe today is going, something happened yesterday where some group of people that are different from us that we didn't understand, they loved us. They gave us just a little snippet of hope. I got shoes and it was all awesome. And the Apostle Paul, in one of his letters to the Colossians, calls Jesus the image of the invisible God. I love that. Because when people see love in us, they're seeing a God who oftentimes is pretty invisible and hard to see, right? Paul says, I get it, it's frustrating. It's hard to try and follow someone who is invisible. But the good news is that Jesus is the image of the invisible God and we are a reflection of him. So if you wanna know what God is like, just watch Jesus. If you wanna know how God feels, just watch Jesus, learn what he is. If you wanna know how God would interact with people, watch how he does it. If you wanna know who God likes at his table, just watch him and he makes it clear. And then do what Jesus would do. Be that image because God's love extends to all and he expects our love to do the same. This is the amazing mystery, the amazing mystery of the gospel which makes us all new in him, amen? Would you do me a favor and just quietly just stand where you are throughout this room. If you're watching from home, just join us with your heads bowed. We're just gonna have a moment of prayer before we step out into the places of our world that God's positioned us to love. If you're here today and maybe this conversation has sparked something in you and you need prayer, in just a moment when we dismiss, we have our prayer team that's to my left, to your right here if you're in person. And they would love, if you would like to slip in there and just have a moment of prayer after the service, maybe you got a week, maybe something today has challenged you, maybe you're ready to take a step of faith. Our prayer team is equipped and ready to just spend as much time with you as you need. So do that today, will you? But I wanna pray for all of us because as Jesus is the image of the invisible God and we are walking into our world as a reflection of Jesus, let us love the way he loved. God, we just pray right now for our hearts, that as we're being made new and transformed, that you would help us, Father, to do the same in the places that you are positioning us. God, we love that you love us so much. God, we needed, we need your grace. We need that change that happens. But God, help what's happening in us to actually be communicated out. God, even as we leave today, even as we go to a restaurant, God, let us reflect love to those that serve us. Even as we walk through our neighborhoods, walk into our offices, into our school campuses tomorrow, let us have a fresh commitment to the, to the love being coming out of us that we've experienced from you. That the gnosko, the experiential love that we've had from you and knowing you would translate to those that we interact with in our lives. Let our tables be wide as we love you with all our heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.